My name is Tristan Merrill, and I will be presenting the paper Reverse Engineering IoT Devices, Effective Techniques and Methods. The acknowledgments go to the original five authors, all with the Ben Gurion University in Israel. This paper was originally published in the IEEE Internet of Things journal in 2018. The number of IoT devices has been on the rise and was previously estimated to reach 50 billion by 2020. This statistic was cited in the researcher's paper written nearly two years ago. However, present numbers today vary a lot depending on what is defined as an IoT device, but estimates range from 10 to 20 billion. The end result is that there are many devices connected on the global internet. Traditionally, embedded devices were microcontroller-based with no or very primitive operating systems. Modern implementations have proliferated the use of a full-featured operating system such as Linux, and many devices now ship with a variety of networking capabilities often integrated in the chipset. Many systems on chips have hardware not utilized for the final product shipped, but can present itself as a unique attack vector. Attackers can activate this hardware to give the system new features. This combination of factors present new attack vectors overall, which the researchers explore in this paper. The authors present their intended contributions of the paper. They present a reverse engineering workflow for full stack operating system IoT devices and apply this workflow to 16 different devices. They provide insight into effective methods and obstacles while discussing common characteristics and security flaws. They analyze some properties and vulnerabilities to implement new attacks and suggest non-malicious uses of reverse engineering. In conclusion, they offer a list of recommendations to make these devices more secure. The researchers focus on hardware reverse engineering, not software re reverse engineering, and ultimately the end goal is to develop a methodology which can serve as a framework for security researchers who would like to address this glaring problem of IoT security. The authors identify three main classifications of IoT device architectures. These are full stack operating system based devices, such as those with embedded Linux, partial stack operating system based devices, like the real time operating system or RTOS, or devices with no operating system, such as microcontroller implementations. Full stack OS devices are more generic and make use of various drivers and open source components that may have known vulnerabilities. All attacks seen in the wild target devices with a full stack operating system, and therefore the research focuses exclusively on devices with an operating system of this characterization. The authors also point out the devices with partial stack operating systems likely have significant potential for security vulnerabilities. The authors develop an overall reverse engineering methodology that consists of three well-defined steps each of which will be discussed in more depth. The three-step process is device inspection, extraction of data, and analysis of firmware, which can be observed in the figure originally from the researcher's paper. This process was developed under the black box model testing, meaning that the researchers had no prior knowledge of the underlying architecture or design of the devices studied. Their intention was to develop a framework that could be applied to any device, and the ultimate goal was extracting secrets from it, secrets such as logging credentials or private cryptographic keys. The next slide shows a table adapted from the original paper listing all the tools that the researchers used. As can be seen in this adaptation of Table 1, all the tools are easily obtained. All the software tools can be obtained freely off the internet, and all of the hardware tools can be, be obtained relatively inexpensively with the exception of the NVIDIA GPU server. However, the majority of this computing power wasn't even needed for the difficulty of passwords obtained, as we will see shortly. Now the first step in the researcher's methodology was device inspection. They identify two major vectors to gain access to the device, and that is identifying memory components or identifying communication ports that can be used to obtain a console on the device. Locating memory components can be useful for firmware extraction when there is no possibility to obtain a console or run commands on the device. 
Many devices running Linux need sufficient memory to store the kernel and file system. And for reasons of cost savings, these are often located in a chip external to the main processor. These memory modules are usually implemented with technology consistent with the required capacity. One common example is the 25XX or 26XX series 8-pin SPI flash memory holding up to 32 megabytes. Additionally, identification can be performed by searching the engraved device codes on the IC package. And the examples below on the left is a 16 megabyte SPI flash module from a wireless doorbell, and on the right, a 1 gigabyte NAND flash module from the Xtremer cloud camera. Both of these can be researched by the engraved device code on the IC package. In addition to inspecting the device for memory components, the researchers also discuss inspection for determining the universal asynchronous receiver transmitter, or UART, terminals. A UART is an embedded universal communications channel often used for development and maintenance via a Linux console, or a shell. These communications are based on a standard protocol at a predetermined baud rate. They're often embedded in the printed circuit board during the prototyping stages of development and usually they're removed, but sometimes can be kept in the design to reduce production costs or for future maintenance. Alternatively, they could be obfuscated or hidden. This all depends on the manufacturer. Now, connecting to the UART allows easy access for communication with the operating system. UART terminals are sometimes visible and in accessible locations, even with clear markings. Other times, they're hidden either intentionally or unintentionally, depending on the manufacturing process. And the picture below shows UART terminals from the same Xtremer cloud camera. You can see below visually the three main terminals, ground, receive, and transmit, all next to each other. Basic UART communications requires the three terminals mentioned previously, transmit, receive, and ground. There's oft often two to four electrical pads in a row. The third and fourth are sometimes the ground and VCC. The communication operates in a range of voltages from plus 1.8 to plus 5 volts. And based on the potential electric properties, a multimeter and digital analyzer can be used to verify suspected pads. Additionally, the researchers discussed their development in the UART discovery module, something that aided them in discovering UART terminals on the PCB. This aided them for PCBs that did not have UART terminals that were clearly marked, and it tested for three different common baud rates on the transmit line and alert, alerted the user with an audible sound after encountering a specified number of English printable ASCII characters. The printable ASCII characters specifically are in the range of hex 20 to 7F. And the picture below shows the UART discovery module with a piezoelectric speaker. So step two, after device inspection, the next step is to extract the firmware and data. Now the main attack vector that the researchers described involved locating UART terminals to gain a console. Now for a review of how the Linux, Linux operating system boots, the bootloader loads the kernel and passes the boot arguments to the kernel. The path for a user mode process that starts on boot up is in the boot argument. A, a process includes the init process, which ultimately loads the login process. Now, to bypass the login process, the researcher simply replaced the boot argument for init with bin sh. This ensured that when the Linux kernel was booted, instead of being directed to the login process, the operating system booted directly into a shell. Now, in order to change the bootloader argument, it is necessary to access the bootloader terminal. Typically, this can be accessed from key presses at the initial boot, unless they have a password. However, due to the low memory footprint, these passwords are often small, unhashed, and are hard-coded strings that can be obtained from memory via out-of-band methods. Alternatively, for those devices which had a read-only UART, uh, or otherwise could not gain access to the bootloader to modify the arguments. Uh, fault injections are something which were utilized by the researchers. This is where a hardware fault 
will cause the initialization process to fail, resulting in the system to fall back into a highly privileged shell process. The example that the researchers describe in the paper includes shorting the ground and the master in slave out pins of the SPI flash module, causing any reads of the device to be malformed. So the extraction of firmware over the network is the preferred method. However, embedded operating systems are often shipped with a subset of the standard tools in a typical PC distro. And this is just because tools such as Netcat aren't typically needed for an IoT device. However, many utilities like Netcat have had versions that are reduced in size and pre-compiled for other architectures and freely available on the internet. Using this and with wget or the trivial file transfer protocol, TFTP, the researchers were able to install these custom versions of Netcat onto the device. This allowed them to extract the, firm, uh, extract the file system off the device over the network. Alternatively, if network access is not available, the researchers developed a custom Python script which utilized the Unix echo command to transfer that data over the UART. Now again, network and console access are the ideal circumstances, and this is because the file system can be compressed using tar and streamed out using netcat. And this removes the need to unpack the file system from a raw firmware image, which is not always a trivial task. However, it can also be read out over the UART from the bootloader or the Linux console. A bootloader consoles often contain memory read, write, and display primitives that can be used to slowly dump an image of the memory into the UART console. And lastly, if all else fails, out-of-band methods can be used to dump flash memory in the absence of a network or console access. Some of these out-of-band methods include connecting a logic analyzer to the pins of the memory module and recording the signals during the boot. This can be used to obtain a partial memory image. Or the chip can be desaltered and connected to off-the-shelf readers or custom-made readers to extract the firmware image directly off the chip. Now finally for step three. With the file system or firmware extracted, it was time to analyze it. Now again, in the case of having no network connectivity or other network tools available to, uh, to compress and remove the file system, the raw firmware image needed to be extracted. And in order to unpack it into the file system, there exists a freely available tool called Benwalk. The researchers use this as it can extract systems, file systems from embedded devices. From here, the researchers proceeded to look for hashes for passwords. Uh, with the file system exposed, they were able to browse to the Etsy password or Etsy shadow file to obtain the hashed passwords for the device. Two of the most common hashing algorithms in IoT devices is the DS crypt and MD5 crypt. Modern high-end GPUs can calculate in the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 of these hashes per second. Using Hashcat, an advanced password recovery tool uh, which utilizes advanced rules and patterns and designed for GPU hashing, the researchers were able to crack nearly all the passwords on these devices. Alternatively, although outside the scope of the researchers' paper, they also discussed that with the file system exposed, binaries inside can be analyzed for vulnerabilities uh, using reverse engineering software. For example, the reverse engineering tool Ghidra, which was released by the NSA as an open source tool in 2019 and freely available. So overall, the researchers inspected 16 devices and analyze different features on all of them. All the devices were of various price points and functionality. Many were cameras. Most of them were, in fact, cameras. And all of them contain embedded Linux OS. The researchers discussed specific techniques, including obstacles encountered and the strategies to overcome them. Table 2 in the next slide is originally is adapted from the publication and lists all the devices studied. As you can see from this table, 
11 out of the 16 devices are IP cameras, and they all range in price from the low end to mid-grade. The authors of this paper specifically discuss four obstacles encountered and discuss in a bit of detail how they overcame these. The Simple Home IP camera had a bootloader that was in read-only mode and did not allow keyboard input. Again, using the fault injection, the researchers were able to bypass this. Specifically, they used a paperclip that was used to bridge the, the memory master input slave output in the ground pin, causing any read from the memory chip to fail. This directed the boot process to fall back into a shell. The FOSCAM IP camera had a bootloader that was password protected. The researchers took two different approaches. First, the memory chip contents was dumped to reveal the password, and the second approach was to connect a logic analyzer to sniff the memory contents during boot to obtain the password. The Xiaomi IP camera had no network tools available, and this is the case where the researchers developed a custom Python script that used the echo command, enabling raw binary data to be sent over the UART interface. And lastly, the Echo B3 ter thermostat, the UART terminals were not easily identified, which was the impetus to lead the researchers to build the UART discovery module in order to aid in this process. Ultimately, the UART terminals were available and were accessible, but they just were not labeled, and this device enabled the researchers to easily find it. This is an adaptation of Table 3 from the original paper, listing all the inspected devices and the techniques effective on them. In the column to the farthest right, you can see that for data extraction techniques, nearly all techniques utilize the, the netcat tool for removing the file system. If netcat wasn't available, the researchers used wget or tftp to download netcat. Only two devices had to use other methods that weren't over the network to extract the file system. So the researchers summarized their major discoveries starting with logging credentials. First, choosing the correct hashing algorithm is important. All passwords ranged in complexity from very low, for example, A, B, C, D, to medium level, including capital letters and numbers. Half the devices used DES crypt while the other half used MD5 crypt. DES crypt hashing can be as much as 90 times faster. Additionally, half the devices were running remote access services, including SSH, Telnet, or FTP. Although some of the devices did not allow communication through an administration port, by accessing the UART console, it is possible to set up network services performing the desired functions. Additionally, many devices had pre-configured Wi-Fi credentials that were easily recovered. Since IoT devices need connectivity to function, a config file is included to enable reconnection on restarts. These were located under config or network manager paths and contained all Wi-Fi settings, including service set identifiers and non-encrypted passwords. And these are the passwords of the network the device is attached to, not the device itself. Therefore, a weak IoT device has the potential to, to direct an attack vector to compromise the entire network that it is on. Three devices had hard-coded private keys. The, the security of asymmetric cryptography rests with safekeeping of private keys to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. And finally, four devices were found to share non-trivial passwords or hashes with other devices, indicating rebranding. Oftentimes, internal design architecture file systems are repurchased from other manufacturers for cost savings. Identifying rebranded devices means that previously discovered weaknesses may be identical across devices. This graph from the original paper shows the time to recover passwords from the GPU server. Each marking represents a successfully recovered password. Essentially, this problem reduces to basic password security concepts. Virtually all passwords are cracked within one minute, indicating weak passwords regardless of the hashing algorithm. Passwords hashed with MD5 crypt resulted in longer times to crack, as extrapolated in the graph. This is based on the number of computations the GPU can perform for each algorithm. 
The researchers took this a little further and developed a custom Mirai botnet in a sandboxed environment. The Mirai botnet was a highly distributed malware that affected over 600,000 IoT devices. The relative ease of compromising IoT devices, combined with the lack of consumers' knowledge and security practices, has made it a fertile ground for malicious exploitation. And IoT botnets have been responsible for many distributed denial of service attacks. The Mirai botnet specifically scanned the IP version 4 range for IoT devices and attempted to log in with default credentials. If successful, this device was added to the net. Using recovered passwords for SSH and Telnet from the devices studied, these passwords were added to the custom Mirai. The observed results showed success of the botnet in adding these new devices. The experimental version of the Mirai source code began adding new devices that had not been previously compromised in the wild, including devices of the same manufacturer but not included in the study. This effect would likely propagate among rebranded devices as well. The authors also present theoretical attack vectors that weren't studied specifically but could result from the same vulnerabilities in the devices they studied. Uh, some of these are the discovery of new software vulnerabilities. Many devices contain old operating systems or outdated firmware versions. After identifying which version is present on the device, the attacker could search for known vulnerabilities. Also, a tenant of computer security is to maintain physical security, which can become difficult if the device is in a public location like many security cameras. With public access, a device could be reverse engineered and software uploaded, similar to the researchers using wget to maintain persistence, or the attacker could simply extract secret information, such as Wi-Fi passwords or cryptographic keys. And lastly, devices could be compromised by an untrustworthy vendor or courier, or intercepted in the supply chain. Software could be installed to provide a backdoor or maintain persistence before the end user even receives it. These techniques presented do not damage or otherwise leave long-lasting traces of tampering. So beyond the research, so some ideas that weren't covered specifically in this paper but are inferred by the authors is that uh, the researchers focuses on, focused on extracting information from devices. However, some firmware images can be obtained freely even by download. The FOSCAM C1, which was one of the study devices, can even have user-applied firmware updates obtained from the vendor's website. Using Benwalk, as the researchers discuss, the file system can be extracted from the firmware image. Additionally, vulnerability research of custom applications could reveal zero-day vulnerabilities. With the file system exposed, binaries could be examined more, more closely. Custom web servers are a good starting point due to the lack of open design. And again, with open, so open source and freely available reverse engineering tools such as Ghidra, Reverse engineering of binaries is much easier. And lastly, there exist tools for emulating behavior. QEMU, for example, is a tool that can emulate other architectures such as the ARM processor, which is often used in IoT devices. With this tool, it's possible to emulate a hardware IoT device like a virtual machine. The authors of this paper present their conclusions in six summarized points. Essentially, UART ports typically have no purpose in market-ready products. Obfuscation of UART ports may not be as effective as demonstrated by the UART discovery module. These ports should be removed when possible, but if not possible, should be set to read only. And if a UART port must have write access, they should be predicted better similar to JTAG ports. Overall, vendors need to place extra attention on the necessity of UART ports in the final design. Bootloaders can be protected by physical means, so they only go into debug mode when specified electrical criteria are met, or by using more sophisticated methods of password protection. Many devices of the same model or manufacturer shared common passwords, as demonstrated from the Mirai experiment. Devices should use a stronger hashing algorithm for encrypting passwords, such as the SHA-512 crypt, and hard coding passwords should be avoided. Users must be able to easily create and update passwords. Just like in mobile phones, IoT should follow the example of being able to encrypt the device memory. And lastly, devices should be pen tested before being brought to market. The methodology presented in this paper can be used as a framework for more robust auditing procedures and IoT devices. 
A final conclusions that were not specifically addressed by the researchers in this paper. Developers often seek a balance between security and costs, often defaulting to cost over security. And the barrier of entry to exploiting vulnerabilities in IoT is much easier, as demonstrated by the ease of access of all of the software tools that the researchers used. Embedded developers must evaluate and QA software with much more scrutiny. Hardening physical access should not remove the responsibility of good software development. Many IoT applications do not conform with the principle of open design, and custom web app servers are a prime candidate to contain a remote code execution vulnerability. Embedded code has often been written in C, a weakly typed language which is notorious for leaving vulnerabilities. Thank you, and this concludes my presentation.